Good morning. Today, I want to share with you a simple, beautiful, interesting story of the nameless man. Yes, the nameless man. The story I'm going to share with you appears in each of the three synoptic, synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, but not in the gospel of John. So Matthew chapter 8, Mark 5, and Luke 8 give us details of the story of Jesus' encounter with the nameless man. <clears throat> it's a significant story of Jesus' love, compassion, and power. Significant because looking at the background of the story, Jesus, in spite of being so tired from his ministry, shuts down a storm, crosses the sea with his disciples, to reach this one nameless man to bring his love and salvation to him. Just a little while before he reaches this man, Jesus was with thousands, teaching them, doing miracles, healing the sick, ministering to these precious thousands of people. But just a few hours later, he's on a mission to reach out to a man who was considered and treated as an outcast in his region. And interestingly, it was not even uh, within uh, the Jewish area of that time. He actually moved out of the Jewish, uh, the area that was predominantly Jewish, and he moves into Gentile territory, which was all under Roman occupation. And the Lord came for him. Jesus was going to love, deliver, and save that man, and consequently confront and evict the demonic powers that ruled that region. By now, some of you may have already guessed who I'm talking about. What is the story that I'm referring to? So let's read the story in one go from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5 verse 1 to verse 20. I will read the entire story. And then, like I like to do, we will glean from it, summarize, and then look for what we believe the Lord is trying to tell us this morning from this beautiful story of Jesus' love, compassion, and power for the nameless man. Mark 5 from verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, into the region of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and cutting himself with the stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had already been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, that is Jesus, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. Now there was a large herd of pigs feeding nearby on the mountain. And the demons begged him saying, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the countryside. And the people came to see 
what it was that had happened. And when they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had previously had the legion, they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the pigs. And they began to beg him to leave their region. And he was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed was begging him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him. But he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So beautiful. I do think that it's interesting that there's so many details that is given the story about this man about the region, about the way he was being oppressed, about the havoc that he had caused. And interestingly, in all of these details, given in not just this gospel, but even the other two gospels of Mark, of Matthew and Luke, we see that his name is not mentioned. I want to just take this bunch of few verses as we go through from verse 1 to verse 20 and just take out some things for our encouragement and understanding. You know, Luke 8 says the demonic came from the country of Gerasenes. We're looking at verses 1 to 5, verses 1 to 5 now from Mark. And uh, whereas Matthew 8 says he came from the country of the Gadarenes, Gerasenes, Gadarenes. Now, if you would look at uh, the map of Israel during the days of Jesus, you will actually see if you're looking at Israel as it is, if you're familiar with how Israel looks on a map, and this region comes on the right of the River Jordan that flows. So you have the Sea of Galilee in the north, and that flows down the Jordan River and comes down to the Dead Sea. And so this would be on the right. So you have uh, this region, and it was actually called the Decapolis, or the region with the ten cities. So in the days of Jesus, um, it was the Decapolis with Gerasa being the local power city or center of that region. All of this was under Roman occupation. Now, there's an interesting biblical history to this region beginning in the Old Testament. So we go back to the time of Jacob. Who was Jacob? Well, the grandson of Abraham. And Jacob, among his sons, his seventh son was Gad. His mother was Zilpha, who was Jacob's first wife, Leah's maid. So Gad was the father or the founder of the tribe of Gad. And just before Jacob died, many of us would be aware that he actually called his 12 sons to himself. And he began to prophesy on each of them. He actually told them in Genesis 49, it's recorded that gather on so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. The chapter then shares Jacob's prophecies regarding many of his sons. He went son after son, laid hands, prophesied on each of them. And a brief look at each prediction or prophecy reveals that they were fulfilled. Now here comes the interesting part. Of Genesis 49 verse 19, he comes to Gad, his son, the seventh son. And verse 19 simply notes that Gad would be effective in military struggles. It is difficult to link this, what is prophesied about Gad, to any direct fulfillment due to the concise form of the prophecy that Gad received. Well, some Bible teachers have seen a fulfillment of this prediction in the great number of troops who served King David later on from the tribe of Gad in 1 Chronicles 12, as it is recorded. So this is what Jacob actually said to Gad. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Now, all good Bible students remember the verse in the book of Revelation. What does it say? It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
And what that really means is that all prophecy in scripture, though many times progressive in its fulfillment over the generations, finds their ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I believe and what I'm trying to link with what was prophesied by Jacob to his seventh son Gad, to the region of Gadarenes that we're talking about, where Jesus actually went to reach out to this nameless man, was that Jesus coming to this region for this man was the climatic messianic fulfillment of this prophecy. Because if you remember from what we read in this, about the story, when Jesus asked this man, who are you? The demons within reply, we are a troop, we are a legion. That was, in Roman understanding, approximately 6,000 troops. And so, I believe that this was a messianic fulfillment of this prophecy that a couple of thousand years before was actually prophesied by Jacob upon his son Gad, now being fulfilled. And what a way it was being fulfilled. It was fulfilled in Jesus' loving and powerful encounter with the nameless man. Imagine that what happened that day in the region of the Gerasenes of Gadarenes was prophesied hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of years before by Jacob as he laid his hands on his son Gad. He said, a troop shall come from you, against you, and you shall triumph. Why? Because the Lord will come to you. And it was fulfilled in the life of one man a nameless man. And verses 1 to 5 in Mark chapter 5 describe the horrific plight of this man. We don't know the reasons why he had come into this condition. But the fact is clear. He had a family. Because at the end of it in verse 19, Jesus actually tells him, go home to your family. This man had a family. He had a home. He had relatives. He belonged to some people. He belonged to a community. But for whatever he went through in life, he had come to a place of such a horrific plight, oppressed day and night by not just one, two, or ten demons, but a legion of them, 6,000 demons, wrecking havoc not only on him, but in that entire region, because we also read in those details that he, they tried to chain him. They tried to bind him. They tried to subdue him. But no one and nothing was successful. That means this man or the enemy had created havoc, and spread fear in that entire region through the oppression that this man was suffering. So this was as much as a personal issue was also a challenge for that entire region. Jesus was going to bring his love and compassion and power to this man. But in doing so, was going to confront and break the hold of the enemy in that entire region and evict the enemy out of there. Verses the 6 to 9? Beautiful. It says Jesus comes as he gets off the boat and he approaches the man. We see that there is a confrontation. But actually, I would say it with a smile. There was not even a confrontation. As soon as the man sees or the demons see at the very side of Jesus, all that is described in the first five verses just disappears. All the havoc, all the screaming, all the yelling, all the chain breaking in a moment just disappears. They do what must be done before the Son of God. They bow. They simply bow at the side of Jesus. The demonic powers who oppressed that man and caused such havoc, spread such fear in that entire region, simply bow at the sight of Jesus. And beloved, that what must happen today, in us and through us, where we go, we should not be fearing the enemy or the works of the enemy. We should be able to see the kingdom of God ushered in in love and compassion and in power, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Verses, as we move ahead, verses 10 to 14, we understand that as this man is about to be delivered and there is a conversation, a very basic conversation that happens between the demons and Jesus. There is a mention by the demons of a, of a herd of pigs. 
Now that clearly helps us see that this was a Gentile region, though historically, this was all part of the land that God had promised the people of Israel. And that's precisely why we're referring to the prophecy that Gad received that this region would belong to him. But in the time of Jesus over there, during the days of uh, the gospel, this had become a Gentile region. You would not find any Jews uh, taking care or, you know, having a herd of pigs because they were clearly considered as an unclean animal uh, by the Jewish people, according to the Old Testament law. So this was a completely Gentile region under Roman occupation. And that's something to be kept in mind, that Jesus is clearly making a communication over here. I have not just come for the lost sheep of Israel. I've come even for the Gentiles. I've come for the whole world. And so from verses 15 to 17, we see that this nameless, precious man is delivered. You know, there's one detail that Luke's gospel has that the other gospel writers, Mark and uh, Matthew and Mark, uh, don't refer to. And that is the nakedness of the demonic person, of the, of the nameless man. He was naked. And uh, obviously in that horrific condition of his, he was obviously not aware of the condition that he was without clothes. And in Luke 8.27, Luke writes our notes that he wore no clothes, but in verse 35, after Jesus delivers him and sets him free, he is clothed and in his own mind. And we see that this detail helps us understand his transformation. His transformation and his restoration as a human being. Initially, the possessed man had been expelled as such from the human community. And in, in other words, that he was no better off than those pigs without clothing, like an animal. But after his freedom, his full value as a child of God is restored. And he is now prepared to be restored back into community, clothed and in his right mind. Beloved, that must help us understand that the work of the gospel, that the work of salvation is spirit, soul, mind, and body. We must take care of the entire being and needs when we talk of salvation. Salvation is not merely only seeing a person saved from their sins. It is about seeing a person experience. In fact, if you look theologically at the word salvation, soterio, it doesn't just mean being forgiven of your sins. It means the complete restoration of the human being in and because of the gospel. So every dimension of the human being, spirit, soul, mind, body, community, every part of his role and responsibility is included in the power of the gospel. And we see that in the life of this nameless person. That when the people come back, come from that region, the word goes out. Immediately, like fire the news spreads that this man has been changed. And there is this man who has come, this prophet or this teacher is who's come with his disciples and he has brought healing and restoration and miracle has happened. And these herd of 2,000 pigs have, have all, you know, plunged into the sea and the word comes out and, and the people of the region come running out to see and they're shocked by what they see. But even more shocking is the response of the people of that region. Shocking is the response. You know, it's interesting that when we read in the account, we saw earlier <clears throat> that there is a word used in verse 7. That when Jesus first confronts this nameless man and the demons are in him and they are beginning to plead with Jesus, there's a word used called implore. That means if they're pleading, the demons plead with Jesus, oh, don't send us into the pit of hell. Don't send us into the bottomless pit before time. But allow us to go to those herd of swine. I hope you remember that detail that was mentioned earlier. It's interesting that the same word is used in 
a few verses below when these people come out to see what has happened to this man and so shocking that when they come and see that this man is now clothed in his right mind his heel you see jesus is there with his disciples these people who have come and have seen this miracle now begin to plead with jesus like the demons did just probably uh, an hour earlier these people begin to implore jesus you know to do what please leave please leave jesus and it is shocking we not we are not able to understand why would a uh, people respond to jesus and to his precious work in that manner you know john chapter 1 john writes he says you know the reason people rejected the light is because they loved the darkness rather than the light but yet the lord was not done because this precious nameless man as i have been calling him that very man would now be an ambassador of god's love of power of his grace and truth to that region my brothers and sisters you know many of you or some of you would be able to testify of god doing you know an amazing work in your life you know i i have my own precious story of how the lord saved me and each of you who have surrendered your life to jesus you know have a precious story of what god has done in your life i want to say this to you and remind you that the very demonic powers that oppressed you now fear you because they know who you belong to they don't fear you and me because of you and me they fear you and me because of who the lord is and what he has done in our life and because of what he has done we belong to him they fear that they recognize who we belong to and we become the lord's witness to the very people who rejected us as outcasts brothers and sisters we cannot win a city unless we don't win a town within the city we cannot win a town if we have not yet won a street or a lane and you cannot win a street or a lane if you do not win them soul by soul and that one redeemed soul can take the gospel to that entire city you know the man in the gospels here in this story was a nameless man and i find that interesting because in other accounts about other miracles we see that you know the gospel writers specifically you know give the name of the person jairus his daughter tabitha you know or mary magdalene when we see there are places clearly where you know the name is mentioned but when we look at this story which all the three gospel writers out of the four you know write about this entire account there's only details that are given could they not have found out obviously who is this man they could have i believe it, obviously that by the inspiration and the direction and the command of the holy spirit the name is not been given such a dramatic such a significant story such a striking story beautiful story yet for us 2000 years later is still the nameless man what was important for that man was that jesus knew him and that jesus came for him the jesus though he was so tired from his ministry and we see that account in when you read the gospels just just a chapter before that like for example in mark 4 or, or matthew 7 when you read the accounts jesus was actually you know teaching for days to crouch And Jesus being so exhausted we know that he undertook that boat journey you remember the first boat journey where he goes he gets into the boat and he, Jesus falls out to sleep and the gospel writers actually write that Jesus was tired but Jesus you know though being tired gets into the boat calms the storm that came up and he's out there with a mission to reach out to this man what was important 
for that man, this nameless man, was that Jesus knew his name and that he came just for him. What was of further importance was not that people then or now would know his name, but rather that people would know the name of Jesus through him and his story. This healed man took the message of hope and healing to that entire Gentile region of the Decapolis. You know, in verse 19, we see that, you know, he began to plead with Jesus. Lord, I want to come with you. You know, these people rejected me, Lord. You know, they couldn't help me. And I'm, I was, I've, I've been considered as an outcast of you. Let me follow you, Lord. I want to come with you. And Jesus actually tells him in verse 19 of Mark 5. And he did not let him. But he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. How he had mercy on you. Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. What does this speak to you this morning, my brothers and sisters? Does this speak to your heart right now as you heard this? Because Jesus came for you, my friend. He crossed the infinite gap between the infinite holiness of the Father and the horrid sinfulness on this earth. He came to this earth in absolute humility, lived a life without sin, perfect in every way, righteous and pure. Yet he, Jesus, died on the cross, bearing the unimaginable weight of your and my sin and our punishment. And he rose again, defeating the devil, disarming all principalities and power, conquering sin, conquering death. And he offers the gift of eternal life to all who surrender to him in love. Have you received this gift of eternal life, my brothers and sisters and my friends who are hearing me this morning? Have you received the assurance that your sins have been forgiven and that you are a child of God? If yes, fantastic. If no, then surrender your life to Jesus right now. Don't wait even for this message to get over. And as I close, I ask each one of you to think upon the words of Jesus to the nameless man. And what would it mean to you today? Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Do your relatives do your friends, have your colleagues had the opportunity to hear what the Lord has done for you? Have they had an opportunity to hear about the Lord from your life story? You know, we are on the verge of completing our season of Alpha. And what great joy it has brought, you know, the brothers and sisters in our community who have had the joy and the privilege of running and hosting an alpha for their loved ones and friends. Beautiful conversations have happened, some of them intense, but for the very good. Sister has been able to share the gospel with her brother. Cousins have been able to share the gospel with their cousins. You know, friends have been able to share the gospel with the friends and with colleagues. Conversations that had never happened before have, have, have happened now. Because somebody said, I want my friends, my relatives, my cousins to know what great things the Lord has done for me. And as we are coming to this close of the Alpha season, I want to invite you, I want to encourage you to pray for your loved ones and friends. And 
find a way to share your story with them. Get in touch with us if you want to know how you can host an alpha. And through that, conversations can begin where they will be able to know what the Lord has done for you. Why are you making an attempt to share the gospel with them? Why are you inviting them to Alpha? Why are you praying for them? Why are you reaching out to them? It's because the Lord has had mercy on you, my brothers and my sisters. So beloved, here was the story of the nameless man. And nameless will he remain till we meet him one day in heaven and <laughs> say, what is your name? Because the Lord has done a wonderful work in your life. The Lord crossed the seas, shut down a storm and came to you. What is your name? And what happened after you went back to your home and went back to your community and your people? What did the Lord do? And it will be exciting to hear the story and the name of the nameless man. But till then, let the people around us know the name that is higher than every other name, the name of Jesus. Go home, tell your people what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. God bless you.